Thank you for the introduction. And I really enjoyed Krishna's talk, and I'm delighted that it ended on the idea of reproducibility and quantification, because I want to talk about how we can think quantitatively about perfusion and what it means to validate perfusion. Um, we receive research support from GE Healthcare. So throughout this course, hopefully we've conveyed as instructors how important it is to quantify cerebral blood flow as delivery of essential nutrients, uh, such as oxygen, which is extracted by tissue, but also you know, whether pharmacological agents are able to reach the brain, as well as imaging agents to actually produce um, the images that we care about. And this is important not only in cerebrovascular disease, such as stroke that you might be familiar with, but in many neurological disorders, including normal aging and neurodegeneration. So we have a lot of experience with cerebral blood flow imaging. So it's been about two decades or more that these techniques that we've heard about, ASL and DSC, have been applied readily and tested in the clinic. And both of these papers came out in 2015 where working groups have come together to create consensus protocols for standard clinical acquisitions of these perfusion measurements. But the work here is not done because if you look even in these consensus papers, they're highly uh, relevant and cited and give specific parameters, but they can't cover all cases. Even in the ASL consensus paper, for instance, you go to an individual case where there's a stent in the internal carotid artery, and this poor labeling can contribute a misdiagnosis of hypoperfusion. Or in DSC, you know, there's maybe not even consensus sometimes in how clinicians describe perfusion. So if you say increased perfusion, are you talking about cerebral blood volume, um, transit time, or actually cerebral blood flow? So these sort of considerations you know, still pervade, and we need to work harder to validate these different perfusion metrics. And I want to talk about two reasons why this validation has been challenging. And the first is an inability to compare directly with what's considered a reference or a gold standard. And secondly, insufficient testing in patients in which we care the most about CBF measurements, but where pathology such as um, vascular malformations may interact with the imaging mechanism and actually create the CBF inaccuracies. So throughout this talk, hopefully by the end, um, we'll cover two sections about multimodal imaging and then the concept of cerebrovascular reactivity and hopefully this will give you some concepts of how when you're testing a perfusion protocol for your own site, whether it's research or clinical, what you can do to feel confident in your perfusion measurements. So in contrast to Krishna's talk, I'm gonna mostly focus on arterial spin labeling. And as we learned in the early sessions, it relies typically, especially in the consensus set of parameters, on pseudo-continuous labeling with RF pulses. So it's non-invasive RF tagging of spins. There's a control and a tag. And the critical parameter that creates a lot of problems in patient cases is this post-label delay. So it's just a user-defined uh, parameter. And so in pseudo-continuous ASL, once you perform these experiments with enough signal averaging or background suppression, you can get a map like this of perfusion. And this sort of map, each voxel, is representing a mean of perfusion into the microvasculature or capillary bed for that cortical tissue in this case, for that voxel. Right, so a logical way to look at ASL images MRI and validate it is to find a technique that gives you a parameter map that looks like this, that represents a similar average uh, microvascular perfusion and validate it in that way. So what is considered a reference standard or gold standard? So there are two techniques, xenon CT, either with stable or radioactive xenon, as well as O15 water PET that are typically considered reference standards in the community. And this is because each of these agents, which are exogenous agents, they have to be administered, are freely diffusible, meaning it dissolves into the blood readily and it crosses the blood-brain barrier, no problem. And not only that, there's a way to quantify the arterial input, either through arterial blood sampling with PET, 
or monitoring the end title xenon concentration for an input function, and then the time activity curve of each voxel as the output of the system. And there are well-characterized uh, Keddy schmidt models or one tissue compartment models that give you quantitative uh, characterization with these two references. But this is really hard to do in the clinic, and this is why a lot of the studies have faced challenges in comparing to a gold standard. The half-lives, especially of O15, um, which is probably the most commonly used gold standard, is only two minutes, and it's very challenging to do this clinically. Um, but investigations have done this. So here's an example of what you could do if you had two separate scans with PET and ASL MRI. So this is from an Amsterdam group where in 13 healthy volunteers, the images of quantitative blood flow have been normalized across these healthy volunteers into the same brain template. And then you can perform statistical parametric mapping and identify areas where ASL either overestimates, such as in the deep cortical matter, or underestimates, such as uh, the basal ganglia right here. And you can do this iteratively, so if you, for instance, perform ASL with vascular crushing, which are these gradients that remove uh, intravascular signal that is not actually in the microvasculature, then you can adjust and look again at the statistical parametric maps and see that a lot of the overestimation has been remedied with vascular crushers. So this is an example of a setup, and this is a very carefully controlled experiment that is very hard to do because of two separate scans. Now you might ask the question, do the measurements, if you're comparing to a gold standard, have to happen at the same time? And there is some evidence that it makes a difference. So we did a literature review, and what you're seeing here is literally the correlation between PET and MRI CBF values reported by different studies that used both modalities. And it's plotted against the days elapsed between the two modalities. And you can see as the time uh, between the two sessions is longer, then not surprisingly, um, the scan reproducibility or comparison is more challenging. And that's not surprising because physiology varies so um, with each day or with what you eat, it varies a lot um, over the course of a day. So it's not to say it's impossible to do the experiment with separate scans. In some groups, um, this is a ASL uh, carefully controlled experiment where within a session or even up to a week, there's good scan-rescan correlation that's been shown, but you have to pay a lot of attention. And if you've had coffee this afternoon to stay awake, you know, your CBF may have decreased by 30% from the time you took the coffee to now where you're sitting and listening to this talk. So one way to get around this potential confounder is to take advantage of new hybrid technologies such as simultaneous PET MRI, where the PET detectors are integrated into the bore of the magnet. And this is a good opportunity to actually validate physiological markers that could vary between scan sessions and also improve the quantification with multimodal information. So I want to go through an example of what this might look like in patients with Moya Moya disease. And these are patients that have very long arterial transit delays. And because the arteries at the base of the brain become blocked, they develop these collateral pathways that elongate this arterial transit time and make it very challenging to do ASL. So if you have, for instance, in this case, a young female patient with bilateral disease, if you scan with standard consensus ASL parameters, you might see an image like this. And you look at the image and there's heterogeneity. It's hard to interpret until you have a simultaneously acquired PET image. So here the PET, which is our reference, has a lot more uniform CBF along the cortex. And it leads us to hypothesize ways in which the ASL uh, mechanism is creating inaccuracy. So for instance, the higher signal on the left side might be labeled by the RF, but that's arrived to the imaging size still in slow-flowing large vessels. Or on the right hemisphere, maybe even longer transit delays that have lower signal because the signal has not even arrived to the imaging slice. So 
these sort of hypotheses of how to improve ASL can come from a direct comparison. You can test it with, for instance, a DSC image where you look at the time to maximum. And exactly in this case, as we predicted, there are delays on either hemisphere, but more severely on the right hemisphere. And another way to test it and improve the methods is use a multi-delay ASL strategy, which is not part of the consensus, but has been used quite frequently. And here, instead of using one pulse label delay, sequentially you can acquire five different pulse label delays. And what that allows us to do is monitor the kinetics of arrival, um, this arterial transit time, uh, flow into the microvasculature and decay of the RF tag. And once you're able with multiple observations, multiple post label delays to monitor arterial transit time, you can actually correct for it in the CBF map. And you might get an image that looks more similar to the PET in terms of its CBF distribution, which we see here. And not only that, the arterial transit time has similar profile to the time to maximum map, which is also confirming our hypotheses. And even if you push the long label um, long delay ASL for a even longer pulsable delay of four seconds, you see this uniform CBF along the cortex, which matches. But notice here the basal ganglia, um, as we've seen in those template slides, the basal ganglia seems to underestimate because it has different relaxation properties. So this is an example of a case where we've walked through and we can take in a patient with very severe arterial transit times and kind of modify the ASL through comparison with what the reference standard should be. Um, and if you do this, it's even in the very severe cases in this Moya Moya patients, across 15 patients here, we see even though there's correlations with each of these different ASL scans with PET, it's actually the long label long delay that has the strongest correlation. So you have to adjust the post label time. And in addition to post-label time in other patients, such as sickle cell anemia patients, there's differential flow velocities, in particular increased flow velocities in some of the um, major inflow arteries. And this might lead to different labeling efficiencies from what we might predict versus measured in these patients. So this is another example case of how we might adapt with comparison to address confounds of arterial spin, spin labeling. Um, and one comment about, is it possible to do this with DSC and PET? And I think this is more challenging because DSC, unlike ASL, has, uh, requires a contrast agent, and this is an intravascular agent, so it's not a diffusible tracer, it's non-diffusible, and we're monitoring its susceptibility artifacts. So when you look, in this case, in a uh, patient with cerebrovascular disease, you look at DSC image like this, and it's hard to interpret some of the heterogeneities in the same way, because whether you're using a T2 or T2 star weighting, what the gadolinium concentration is, all of these um, influence the regional aspects of DSC. And in this paper, even though there were nice correlations in quantitative DSC cerebral blood flow with PET, this comparison relies on scaling to the white matter because DSC typically, unless you are able to deconvolve with more advanced reconstruction methods like Krishna has started to talk about, typically you're stuck with a rel relative cerebral blood flow map. And the last thing I want to talk about in this first half of the talk is how to think about validation when we have newer versions of ASL. So here's a paper from Hanzang Lu's group that takes a fingerprinting, which is a paradigm to do MR that kind of transcends our typical thought of, you know, each TR should have a label and you should wait a specific prescribed time. We rethink the imaging acquisition to have it more randomized in this case for ASL, randomizing control and label, um, varying the durations of the post labeling uh, time instead of having one prescribed post label time each um, TR. So with this randomized acquisition, if we then have a one or two tissue compartment model with assumptions about certain aspects of the signal in this, the signal biophysical model in these two models, 
then what you're able to do is match an acquired signal from this randomized scan to a fingerprint, to the best fit dictionary fingerprint. And this gives you multiple parameters because all these parameters are inherently simulated into a dictionary and the best fit will give you parametric maps. Um, in this case, again, of a Moya Moya disease patient, the bolus arrival time, for instance, matches very nicely to um, CT uh, time to peak. So fingerprinting is a promising way to actually potentially improve the time efficiency um, to acquire multiple quantitative parameter maps related to perfusion. And I think in this case, what we want is not necessarily to take each individual voxel and compare it to PET or CT, but ultimately we might even think about other scales. So I would hope that in future work there are more preclinical models that can help us look, for instance, with two-fold column microscopy, you can get to two nano uh, micrometers scale and actually improve the biophysical model on which fingerprinting is built. So I would hope that this is another way we can validate um, newer fingerprinting ASL scans. So in the second part of the talk, I want to kind of touch more on clinical settings and ask, well, does the validation have to be quantitative? So in the idea of identifying you know, patients who are good candidates for therapy and stroke, we're always looking for the elusive penumbra. And this penumbra is an area of affected tissue around an infarct core that could potentially be saved. And we want to find patients with a penumbra um, as characterized by physiology. So in basic physiological experiments, you might be able to identify thresholds of cerebral blood flow or oxygenation that help us identify where the penumbra is or whether a patient has a penumbra. And you could do this you know, very brute force with quantitative assessment. So here's you know, a case where a German group um, from Leipzig did PET MRI simultaneously with ASL and PET. And if you look at ROI definitions of infarct and penumbra, if you're able to do this in more stroke patients, then you could potentially identify quantitative thresholds. But I don't think it needs to be this quantitative. And in fact, one of the most exciting things that's happened recently in stroke perfusion imaging is that it's been shown to be really helpful in stroke treatment directly. So, you know, the typical onset to treatment window is 4.5 hours to 6 hours of whether the patient can receive a clot buster drug called TPA. Um, but the Diffuse 3 trial, which is led by Greg Albers at Stanford, recently published and presented at ISC this year stunning results where either with CT or MR, you identify a putative penumbra. And this relied a lot on, for instance, with DSC, identifying an area of hypoperfusion based on Tmax. And for these patients, um, you're able to extend the time treatment because they have a penumbra. You know they will benefit with either TPA or even more advanced revascularization procedures. So this is heartening because imaging will make a difference. And I think in this case, the quantification, you know, was, it's unclear whether if we have quantitative CBF, whether this will improve, time will tell in future studies. But it's interesting that they could prescribe a similar or the exact protocol for DSC and the exact rapid software reconstruction. So all the centers use the same reconstruction and still get really nice results from this clinical trial. And I think in the future, it's not just CBF, but I think clinical trials will be based eventually on cerebrovascular reactivity. And hearkening back to this Amsterdam group of comparing PET and ASL, they not only did this at baseline, but during hypercapnia, which is breathing elevated levels of CO2 to elevate the CBF and look at this response, this idea of a stress test for the brain where the brain can potentially augment or not in response to an external challenge, and this may tell us something different from baseline perfusion. So here is an example from um, a Moya Moya patient we scanned on PET-MR, where we've given a vasodilator, 
called Diamox. And this is an easy clinical injection to perform, and you wait about 20 minutes for Diamox to have its full effect and monitor the increase. So here, the patient has not only, it has an increase in blood flow on the unaffected side, but on the stenotic side, you see there's actually an interesting decrease which is not expected. And this is called cerebrovascular steel, and an indication that the patient has poor prognosis. We're starting to see this with multi-delay ASL as well. Now, Diamox might not be something that is easily repeatable um, or tested for reproducibility of these sort of augmentations. But what you could do is actually use these gas experiments, whether you know that's a gas that you prospectively control or you have the patient breath hold, you can kind of design validation studies for this augmentation of CBF depending on different gas challenges. Um, other groups like the Oxford group has also shown that maybe bold is comparable to flow supervascular reactivity with some gases such as CO2, but not others such as carbogen, which is a combination of CO2 and O2. And as I mentioned, eventually, not just baseline, but if you do gas challenges with different staging of hyper and hypocapnia, as you see here, you can look at these different regimes of gas manipulation and even start to characterize different regions within patients with cerebrovascular reactivity. And this is, again, I'll just make a comment that this might be harder with DSC because you would require two injections of gadolinium contrast. It's not to say it's impossible. So here's a paper that came out um, just this year where two injections for DSC MRI was performed. And again, DSC is a relative CBF measurement. So instead of looking at an augmentation in DSC, here they were looking at a change in mean transit time pre and post this vasodilator drug called Diamox. Um, but you might question when you're turning this into like a validation, you know, is it linear, um, the susceptibility effect with the CBF increase? And if we want to do TSC, why not do CT perfusion when most of the clinical trials right now um, do CT perfusion? So there's a lot of challenges and, you know, we can have a discussion about, you know, what's the best way to measure CVR? Um, and the lastly, I'll just make a plug that now that we have multimodal approaches to image cerebral blood flow, perhaps we can make hybrid measurements. So if we trust, for instance, the static O15 distribution of blood flow, but we don't have blood samples, for instance, for the quantitative scaling, if you have PET MRI, you might be able to scale it with phase contrast and actually combine the two measurements where phase contrast gives you the total inflow in these um, major arteries, and you can scale the absolute value into a quantitative blood flow map. And Yosuke Ishii will be uh, presenting this on Wednesday as a power pitch, where he's shown in this case two um, areas of uh, Moya Moya disease. So this right side is mild to moderate disease, and the left is severe. And even though the baseline blood flow with this hybrid PC PET method looks pretty normal, on the strip of reactivity mask, you see a much more severe and actually decreased CVR on the left hemisphere. And we kind of looked at different uh, gradings of this severity and see that cerebrovascular reactivity diminishes with severity of occlusion. So this is more confirmation that you know, CVR is an interesting way to look at disease in these patients. And any measurement, any perfusion measurement that you want to use in the clinic, I think it should be able to detect augmentation reliably too. So don't just validate at baseline. Please validate in multiple conditions. And I just want to point out this nice review that Peng Lu um, just published last year. So learn all about how to do CVR in this review paper. Um, so take home points. ASL is challenging with disease pathophysiology, but as I've shown with that Moya Moya case, we can make it a suitable alternative through multimodal imaging. And please make sure your provision measurements 
do accommodate cerebrovascular reactivity, and we need more studies to validate CVR as a clinical biomarker. Um, and finally, I saw this really interesting member-initiated symposium on Tuesday morning, where I think there's going to be a lot of DSC and ASL experts discussing how to make perfusion more quantitative. So I hope to see some of you there. And thank you to especially my mentor, Greg Zaharchuk, and our whole group. And I'll take questions or just leave the session. Thank you.